And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Fragnetto, who will be running the afternoon panel. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for hanging in there. I know it's been a long day, but there's a prize at the end. He mentioned the reception. It's up on the 36th floor. The, the view up there is just spectacular. Um, so in this panel, I'm going to be talking about the anesthetic management of severe preeclampsia. Then we will have Dr. Sen talking about pulmonary embolus. And I'm told our third speaker is on his way, and he's going to be speaking about pulmonary hypertension, which I know for me causes a shudder whenever I hear that combination, pulmonary hypertension pregnancy. So um, to get started, first of all, I have no disclosures to, to make. And in terms of talking about anesthetic management of the severe preeclamptic, first thing I want to touch upon is some of the changing definitions of preeclampsia that have arisen over the last couple years. Uh, an issue that I think we all struggle with sometimes is what to do in terms of neuraxial techniques in the preeclamptic patient who's thrombocytopenic, so we'll spend some time talking about that. Uh, and then ultimately develop a plan for managing these preeclamptic patients, both for labor and for cesarean delivery. So a little bit first about the epidemiology of preeclampsia. We're all going to see this because worldwide it affects about 7.5% of all pregnancies and here in the U.S. about 3 to 5%. A couple of other things that I think are concerning is looking at the prevalence is that specifically severe preeclampsia has been increasing. You can see here this is severe preeclampsia. Also patients with gestational hypertension and uh, chronic hypertension, that has been increasing within the population also. So it's not going to get any better. We're probably going to start to continue to see more and more of these severely preeclamptic patients on our labor and delivery units. And there is significant morbidity and mortality associated with preeclampsia. This is a, um, a circle chart from the World Health Organization looking at maternal mortality worldwide. And you can see that preeclampsia is the third leading cause of maternal mortality throughout the world. Now, I mentioned there have been some changes in the definitions of preeclampsia. ACOG had a task force a couple of years ago. Dr. Geyser represented our specialty on that task force. Um, but in terms of the definition of preeclampsia, first of all, the blood pressure criteria remain 140 over 90. And there can be the presence of proteinuria for, for preeclampsia, 300 milligrams in 24 hours. However, they no longer require the presence of proteinuria. If a patient has a blood pressure of at least 140 over 90 and any of these other abnormal criteria, decreased platelet count, increased liver enzymes, increasing creatinine, or the development of pulmonary edema, cerebral disturbances, without proteinuria, they still are given the diagnosis of preeclampsia. Uh, the other thing that they've done is they um, have changed in terms of mild versus severe. Actually, it's now being discouraged to use the term mild preeclampsia. Instead, they're asking us to use the term preeclampsia in the absence of severe features. And then the other subcategory is the patient preeclampsia with severe features. There's been a little bit of a change also in terms of the criteria for severe preeclampsia with severe features. Blood pressure ranges have remained the same, systolic of 160, diastolic of 110, um, and several of the other criteria we're used to, the thrombocytopenia, the evidence of liver dysfunction, either because of abnormal enzymes or right upper quadrant pain, increasing creatinine, pulmonary edema, cerebral disturbances. A couple of things that are no longer there you might notice, though, is the 5 grams in 24 hours of proteinuria. That's been removed, as well as intrauterine growth restriction. Another thing that they've now um, emphasized is differentiating between early and late onset preeclampsia, with early preeclampsia being diagnosed as less than 34 weeks gestation at the time of onset, 34 weeks or beyond is considered late onset. The reason that it's felt that we should differentiate between these two categories is that they seem to be sort of different animals. The risk factors for early versus late onset are different and outcomes are different. As you might expect, you tend to see worse outcomes in those patients who have early onset preeclampsia, both for the mother and the fetus. Now, we've talked a little about epidemiology, changing definitions. Now let's get into the meat of it, which is how do we take care of these patients when they present to our labor and delivery unit? And the first thing, of course, is our pre-anesthetic evaluation. 
Um, Dr. Kakmar gave us a great talk on the obstetric airway, and of course, this is key in the preeclamptic patient. And this is just an example of a patient where came to labor and delivery unit, class one airway. Now, you know, a lot of these severe preeclamptic patients, especially if they're preterm, they sit on the floor for a while. We're watching them closely. We don't want to deliver them yet. Someone did that anesthetic pre-op when they first came in. It says that they're a class one airway. Now they've gotten worse. We're taking them to the OR. Well, don't feel confident that they still have a class one airway because they certainly can change. You can see here now a class three airway. So it's crucial that if this patient's going to the operating room or you're going to place an epidural, if they were last seen in terms of their anesthesia pre-op two or three days ago, you need to check that airway again. Other things that are important when we're evaluating these patients before proceeding with our analgesia or anesthesia is to look at the hemodynamic status. Blood pressure control is important. And another thing that has changed over the last several years is that they are being more aggressive, the obstetricians, in terms of treating hypertension. Um, I'm pretty old, much older than, than Dr. Um, Arendt, who was in her teens in the 90s. Um, but back when, when I was a resident, it was unusual to see them treat a systolic pressure below 160 or a diastolic below 110. Now it's being recommended that moderate hypertension be treated, just like we would in a non-pregnant patient. So systolic pressures of 150, diastolics of 100. You will see the obstetricians treating that now. And in fact, there was recently an article in the New England Journal that was a randomized controlled trial, which found that in terms of tight versus less tight blood pressure control, um, for those of you who are of my age, you may remember the reason that we said we don't treat these you know, moderate blood pressures is because we might bottom out the blood pressure and affect the baby. But what they found in this study was that there was no increased risk of, to the fetus when they did treat moderate um, hypertension with tight blood pressure control. We also want to look at the fluid balance of these patients, very important. Um, they are oftentimes intravascularly depleted, but we also know they're at higher risk for developing pulmonary edema. And then there's that question of coagulation status. So what do we need to be looking at there? Well, I think in any patient with preeclampsia, it's mandatory, of course, to have a platelet count. How frequently you check that platelet count, I feel, believes on the trend. If you've had someone on the unit for a couple of days, their platelet count has been stable, we will generally check it every day. On the other hand, if they're getting worse, they were fine, and now, oh, they're getting worse, we need to go to the OR, I want to have a platelet count generally from within at least six to eight hours, and possibly even, and even less um, hours if they're getting very sick quickly, even if that platelet count was six hours ago, might, I might ask them to send one and get it back to me within the next 30 minutes as we're getting ready to go to the OR. One question that has come up sometimes is, do I need any other coagulation studies in these patients? And so um, back in my day as a resident, we routinely got coags on all of these patients with the diagnosis of preeclampsia, especially severe preeclampsia. However, there have been some retrospective studies that have shown that actually Pretty much the only patients that you're going to see other abnormal coags, PT, PTT, fibrinogen, are those patients who have thrombocytopenia or have elevated liver enzymes. So currently, I think the practice of most of us is that we're not going to get anything besides the platelet count to look at um, coagulation um, unless they have thrombocytopenia or elevated liver enzymes. But especially in those patients that we'll talk about in a couple of minutes about deciding do we or don't we do neuraxial anesthesia when they have a borderline platelet count, sometimes having additional information about not only the number of platelets, but how well those platelets are functioning can be helpful in making that decision. So you might consider doing some testing to look at platelet function. And that can be with the use of thromboelastography or Rotem, or if you have it at your hospital, the use of the platelet function analysis test. Now, I understand not every institution has these tests available to them, but it's something to think about as additional information to help with decision making if you do have it available. So now that we've done our preoperative evaluation, looked at the airway, looked at labs, now it's time to take care of this patient who's on our labor floor, maybe undergoing induction, and she needs analgesia. So what do we want to do? Well, of course, we would love to have neuraxial analgesia in this patient. There's many, many advantages in the preeclamptic patient to having a neuraxial um, analgesia on board. As we know, it gives great pain relief. 
As a result of that great pain relief, it's been shown that in these preeclamptic patients that they have reduced circulating catecholamine levels as a result of their pain relief. It's also been shown in severe patients that you can have improvement in your utero placental perfusion, looking at Doppler studies, ultrasound. It's been shown with epidural analgesia on board that there's improved intervillous blood flow and that there's improved uterine artery um, systolic to diastolic ratio. So you can actually make a better environment in the uterus for the fetus with having an epidural on board. And then to me, maybe the most important reason I like to have an epidural in these patients is that if they do go for emergency C-section, and I know that they are at higher risk than your normal, healthy, pregnant patient, you have that epidural on board that you can use, and you can avoid all the risks associated with general anesthesia in these high-risk patients. Difficult airway, severe hy hypertension would be some examples. Um, in terms of um, neuraxial analgesia, we also we have our obstetricians on board with us. And this may not have necessarily been the case many years ago, but um, on the task force that I mentioned that came that ACOG put on a couple of years ago, they do recommend that neuraxial anesthesia be used both for labor and for C-section. And they found that the uh, quality of the evidence for making that recommendation was moderate, and the strength of their recommendation was strong. So they really are on our side in terms of using neuraxial analgesia. So you put an epidural in, or combined spinal epidural, in a patient with severe preeclampsia. So, and what's different about these patients? Well, first of all, in terms of my dosing strategies, I use the same as I would use in any other parturient. The things I really want to talk about in terms of labor analgesia in these patients is the coagulation status, specifically platelet count, and then also treatment of hypotension. Should we be doing that any differently than compared to a non-preeclamptic patient? So at my institution, every time a, new, a resident comes to OB, it's their first time on the service, I inevitably get asked, so how low is too low for the platelet count? What is your cutoff, Dr. Fragnetto? And my answer to them, and they don't like it, is there, I don't have an absolute cutoff. You're actually going to have to use some judgment in terms of deciding whether or not to do a neuraxial technique. And I would say that in all of these patients, you have to weigh the risk of um, doing neuraxial analgesia in a thrombocytopenic patient with the benefits of having neuraxial analgesia on board to both the mom and the baby. Now, what are we most concerned about in terms of the risk? Well, of course, it's epidural hematoma. We talk about it all the time, but the reality is it actually is quite a very rare complication in these patients who are preeclamptic with thrombocytopenia. And what do we know about it? What's out there in the literature? There have been several various retrospective studies. Uh, this pati one particular study looked at almost 3,000 women um, and identified amongst those 3,000 patients, 14 who had platelet counts below 100,000. And these were not all like 90,000. Someone had a platelet count as low as 14,000 and yet still got epidural analgesia. I don't know that I would do that personally, but, but someone did. Um, no neurologic sequelae in any of those patients. Another retrospective study looking specifically at preeclamptic patients with thrombocytopenia. Uh, they identified 62 patients in, in their retrospective review of patients who were thrombocytopenic and got either spinal or epidural anesthesia at the time of cesarean delivery. Platelet counts again in these patients went as low as 19,000, and again, no epidural hematomas, no neurologic complications. So what's the bottom line? Well, my recommendation is, as I said, as I tell my residents, I have no absolute cutoff in terms of when I will or will not do um, an epidural in a thrombocytopenic par parturient. Things that I will do is I look at the patient overall. Does she have any evidence clinically that she's coagulopathic? You know, she's oozing, she's bruising, anything like that. Very important, especially these patients who've been on your labor and delivery unit for a few days, is to look at that trend in platelet count. You know, if the platelet count is 70,000, but it's been between 70 and 75,000 for the past three, four days, I don't worry at all about doing an epidural in that patient. Um, if the platelet count is less than 100,000, I will um, get other coagulation studies um, to help me in my decision making and will consider performing usually a PFA 100. I also do have the luxury of having TAG available at my institution, but I really only use that in the patients who have a borderline platelet count.
Um, and then the most important thing is to assess each patient's risk for general anesthesia. I will tell you that I will go significantly lower in platelet count in performing a neuraxial technique in that patient who has a BMI of 60 and a class 3 airway as opposed to the patient who has a BMI of 25 and a class 1 airway. So again, it's all about the risk and the benefit. Um, in terms of some overall recommendations, I think you would find that pretty much every obstetric anesthesiologist who focuses their time in OB would say that they're quite comfortable placing a neuraxial technique in someone with a platelet count 80,000 or above if, it, if it's um, been stable. Now, if someone had a platelet count eight hours ago of 200,000 and now it's 80,000, that would be, again, a different story. But if it's been stable 80,000 and above, no problem. I think it's that borderline between 50 to 80,000 where you've got to use your own judgment about the risk versus the benefit of doing a neuraxial technique. And I think most of us would probably avoid a neuraxial technique when the platelet count gets below 50,000. Now another aspect that I wanted to talk about in terms of neuraxial analgesia is if the patient does become hypotensive, what am I going to do about that? As we know, a component of preeclampsia is that there is compromised uteroplacental placental perfusion. So if we drop mom's blood pressure, we may more likely see a fetus who is affected by that than more so than a normal healthy parturient. And so we may want to be more aggressive about treating hypotension induced by our neuraxial techniques. In terms of the use of a vasopressor, both phenylephrine and ephedrine have been used successfully in the preeclamptic paturient for treating neuraxial induced hypotension. I know that um, we talk about phenylephrine in many studies having been shown to be primarily the preferred vasopressor in pregnant women. Um, and I certainly will use the drug in preeclamptic patients, but I will tell you that nearly all those studies that promote the use of phenylephrine due to the higher umbilical artery pH as compared to ephedrine took place in women with normal pregnancies, not women in situations like preeclampsia where there's a component of compromised uteral placental perfusion. I think the key, though, in terms of treating hypotension in these patients is realizing that they can have an exaggerated response to your vasopressors. So start with low doses. I will start with, you know, 25 to 50 mics of phenylephrine if I'm giving a bolus. Ephedrine, two and a half to five milligrams. You can always give more. Once you've given a big dose and made them hypertensive, you can't take that back. And then I wanted to move on and talk, spend the last few minutes talking about anesthesia for C-section in the severely preeclamptic patient. So as we know, generally in these patients, um, we often prefer to do neuraxial anesthesia as compared to general anesthesia. Um, as I mentioned, we avoid those usual risks of GA in the pregnant patient. Difficult intubation is a concern in any pregnant patient, and I would say that in the preeclamptic patient who oftentimes has facial edema, they may also have airway edema greater than the non-preeclamptic patient, which could make intubation more difficult than just being pregnant in general. The other thing is, is, is that it's been shown that when you do a C-section in a preeclamptic patient, if it's done under general anesthesia, you will see an increase in maternal catecholamine levels, but you will not see that increase if the patient undergoes neuraxial anesthesia. And I think maybe one of the most important reasons to try to use neuraxial anesthesia in these patients is the fact that, <coughs> excuse me, they, are they can have a significant hypertensive response to laryngoscopy and intubation. And there have actually been some studies that have shown in terms of outcomes that, that there are concerns with using general anesthesia specifically related to the severe hypertension that you could cause. Um, we know that in terms of the patients with preeclampsia, intracranial hemorrhage is one of the leading causes of maternal deaths in these patients, with hypertension being a major component of the etiology of that. And there was actually a population-based study which found in these patients that there was an increased risk of stroke in those patients who underwent general anesthesia as compared to neuraxial anesthesia. And this was actually a very nicely done study. Um, and they looked at, um, first of all, unadjusted, you can see over a two times greater risk of stroke. Um, and then they did a multivariate analysis and even went even further and did propensity scoring and still on over two times greater risk of stroke when general anesthesia was used as compared to neuraxial. So a major reason why, if whenever possible, we should do neuraxial in these patients. 
Now, if we're gonna do neuraxial anesthesia for C-section in the severely preeclamptic patient, do we wanna do an epidural or do we want to do a spinal anesthetic? Well, when I was a resident, again, it was many years ago, I was taught you wanna do an epidural, you can incrementally dose the epidural, you'll see less hypotension, you don't wanna do a spinal in these patients because you're gonna bottom out their blood pressure and the baby's not gonna like it and everyone's gonna be really mad at you because you've just made the situation much worse. Um, but on the other hand, as we all know, Excuse me. We, um, there's advantages to a spinal. At least at my institution, I get a better block. It's a more rapid onset, especially in that setting where we have non-reassuring fetal status. That we're, that's why we're delivering. And although there aren't data to support it intuitively, it makes sense if you're doing a neuraxial technique in someone who has a borderline platelet count, that that little 25 or 27 gauge spinal needle is gonna be less traumatic than that large 17 gauge epidural needle. Um, so what about doing a spinal? So the reality is that, that what I was taught as a resident, you don't do a spinal because you're worried about hypotension, that's just not true. There have been several studies that were done quite a few years ago now that found that actually the preeclamptic patient is less likely to become hypotensive after a spinal for C-section than the normal tensive patient. And you can see here in this particular study Throughout the 30 minutes after spinal, blood pressure is higher in the preeclamptic patient, and the change in blood pressure is, is relatively the same, whether they're normal tensive or preeclamptic. Uh, there have been other studies that have also looked at epidural versus spinal anesthesia. There was a randomized prospective study actually looked at epidural spinal in general in severe preeclamptics having a C-section for non-emergent reasons. They didn't find any difference between the three techniques in terms of the lowest blood pressure obtained. And most importantly, we're worried about fetal outcome, no differences in FGAR scores or umbilical artery pH. Um, now there has been um, some studies that have suggested you will see somewhat more hypotension with spinal than with epidural anesthesia. And this was one of those studies where you can see that um, with the epidural, which is the, oops, excuse me. The, the top here, it's higher, but I would concede that that's not necessarily very clinically significant in terms of the differences between the blood pressure and those with epidurals versus spinals. And the other thing was, was that they were aggressive about treating any hypotension that occurred so that the, the median duration of hypotension after doing a spinal in these patients was only one minute. And most importantly, again, looking at the outcome of the neonate. There was no difference between spinal and epidural anesthesia in terms of umbilical artery pH. Now, of course, there are gonna be times when we have to do general anesthesia in the severely preeclamptic patient. Most commonly, it's a severe thrombocytopenia. Platelet counts 20,000, I'm not gonna do neuraxial anesthesia. Sustained fetal bradycardia, we didn't get that epidural in um, before this happened, and now there's no time to do a neuraxial technique. Or the patient who has preeclampsia with her hypertension is at higher risk for abruption, so she may be hemorrhaging. In those cases, I would concede we would do general anesthesia. So when we have to do general anesthesia, how are we going to approach this? Well, if I have the time, if it's not an emergent situation, but more we're doing this because she's thrombocytopenic, for example, I will place an arterial line a careful airway exam and realize that if she has facial edema, she probably also has significant airway edema. Always, as, as Dr. Kakmar said, know what your plans are. What are your backup plans? Have that video laryngoscope available, even perhaps in awake fiber optic if you are concerned that it's a very bad airway. And then also, have smaller endotracheal tubes immediately available as well as a supraglottic um, device. In, in fact, I had one patient, I remember it was Christmas Day, she was so swollen she couldn't even close her eyes. We ended up having to use a 5.0 um, endotracheal tube. So you wanna have small tubes available in these patients. In terms of your induction, of course, this is gonna be a rapid sequence induction. Propofol is generally going to be your preferred agent because neither atomidate or ketamine is going to do anything in terms of blunting that hypertensive response to intubation. Succinylcholine will be your muscle relaxant of choice in these patients. Um, and then you also usually will want to provide something to prevent hypertension on laryngoscopy. And there was a very nice um, review article a couple of years ago in anesthesia and analgesia that summarized many different drugs 
antihypertensives, short-acting opioids that you can use for that situation. What about magnesium? Well, that um, ACOG task force does recommend that the magnesium continue to be used during cesarean delivery. Um, how does that affect us as anesthesiologists? Well, we do know that it will potentiate any non-depolarizing muscle relaxants. So if you choose to use that during your cesarean delivery, I would say start out with small doses and just monitor very carefully with a nerve stimulator. In terms of your succinylcholine, it's been shown that the magnesium is not going to significantly affect either the onset or the duration of a single dose of sucks. So I would use the same intubating dose that I would use in any of our patients. Um, the other concern is what about uterine atony? Well, in fact, um, although that is a concern, studies have not shown increased blood loss um, in this situation. Um, but I would have uterotonic agents available, obviously, in case we have uterine atony. And then a very crucial time is emergence from general anesthesia. This is another time where the patient become, can become hypertensive. So you want to blunt that response to hypertension. Also realize this is another time where you can have airway difficulties. In fact, we're finding as we've gotten very good about managing the airway, more of the airway difficulties occur in that immediate um, post-operative period. So make sure these patients are awake and responsive. And then finally, in the era of perioperative surgical home, we should be involved in the care of these patients postpartum. So remember, they still remain at risk for stroke, pulmonary edema, seizures. You want to continue the magnesium sulfate. You want to closely monitor blood pressure and treat it. Occasionally, questions have come up about the use of NSAIDs in these patients. Clearly, if they're thrombocytopenic, they've been bleeding, you would not use it. But in other patient populations, there's been concerns about NSAIDs increasing blood pressure. That has not been shown to be the case in the peripartum patient. So in that case, you can use NSAIDs. So remember, we still need to file these patients afterwards. And so that is a um, brief review of the preeclamptic pre patient and our anesthetic concerns. So thank you so much.